Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining once again today. And I was thinking of discussing on the discussing on the topic of secularism and bhakti. So I thought of three broad parts. First is to discuss about the history of secularism, how it emerged in the West and then it came to India. Then we can talk about how it has affected the practice and the presentation of bhakti in the present. And maybe we could also talk a little bit in the <laughs> past, basically the interaction of secularism and bhakti uh, historically and contemporaneously. And then lastly, to discuss about how, what can we do to practice and share bhakti in such a setting. Whether we can change the setting or whether we try to adapt, what can we do? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. So, okay. <clears throat> broadly speaking, as far as the word secularism and the concept of secularism has come, it started happening in Europe, mostly wherever the world was in the past, largely speaking religion and uh, pol uh, and politics and in the sense of political rule were not really very strictly separated so whether it was europe the catholic church had a lot of power and it was like a, almost like a ruler above the rulers and when the protestant revolution started <laughs> at that time it was just a few few priests who were opposed but they were supported by many of the monarchs in say France and UK, for example, even Germany, who wanted to break free from the power of the church, from the control of the church. So then they, they supported this uh, breakaway figment and that led to almost like a hundred year war between the Protestant kingdoms and the Catholic kingdoms. And eventually in Europe itself, these two faiths were there, although Broadly, one country associated with one and another country associated with one faith. But overall, after some time, it started overlapping. And as colonization started spreading, then <clears throat> the Europe also, basically, most of the history of the world itself, as we study, is quite Eurocentric. That's why we are also going from that perspective right now. So then, as Europe started spreading, Europe's influence started spreading across the world, it encountered many other cultures also, many other religions, many other faith traditions. And within Europe also, after the reformation, first there was a the renaissance, then the reformation, and then there was the, what is called a scientific revolution. And that's when faith and science started, uh, some amount of confrontation came up. And then more and more people felt that faith became more of a personal issue rather than something in the public sphere. And so it was basically when people either wanted to practice some religion other than the state religion or they didn't want to practice any religion they needed some options <clears throat> and over a period of time the idea came up that <clears throat> the state and uh, state and religion should be separate and that's how the idea of secularism came up and then in india of course at the time of independence when india and pakistan were separated so Pakistan chose to become a <clears throat> become an Islamic country, but India chose to become a secular country. So that's just a brief history. Maybe you would like to add something. <clears throat> well, I think the important thing is to define secularism, but I think we'll come to it uh, yeah. shortly. But if you look at, if you just broadly uh, or in a very simple way define uh, secularism as either separation of the of, of the state from religion, which is the strict textbook definition, or you could see it in terms of having an equal vision uh, with respect to all the religions, then it's not just Eurocentric. You know, let's go further back in history. Mm -hmm. You see, when we speak of Europe and even the Middle East, we are speaking of essentially Christianity and Islam. Yes. Which is a relatively recent origin. Yes. Uh, Islam about 1500 years and Christianity about 2000 years. Of course, Judaism was existing before that. <clears throat> um, but before that, what was the system? 
let's look at it broadly that every society needs some form of governance yes uh, number one so in previous ages the governance was mostly monarchy yes that was the norm and before christianity and islam came and different regions all over the world had their monarchies and then it was up to the monarch what he he or she felt right so if you look at the vedic civilization generally the uh, kings followed the vedic dharma and they tried to see that in the the governance the laws everything was based on vedic dharma so it was very much theocratic in that sense although uh, many kings were broad minded they allowed many strands of of vedic thought and practice and belief to coexist but some uh, like the king kolatunga you know we hear a ramanuja story yes he was very sectarian very narrow minded so we see that the monarchies mostly were not secular yes even when days. buddhism and jainism came in then when some yes. kingdoms became buddhist and jains then there was like official impo- almost imposition of those yeah. religions or at least propagation if not imposition yes and generally you notice that even uh, of course vedic dharma it was a duty of the vedic king to ensure that dharma was being followed and practiced by all the citizens and then buddhism came along and when kings like ashoka and then kings in the southeast and far east also took up buddhism they also introduce that to their citizens and that mm. became more or less the state religion and so on similarly after christianity and islam came and the monarchs took up the religion then they yes. also established that particular religion as the state religion yes. so essentially if you look at ancient history uh then uh governance has always been based on some religious foundation there were of course uh, e- examples of atheistic non dharmic rulers in bhagavatam we are about king vena hmm you know? but by and large uh, the governance was not secular it was based on some form of religious or spiritual understanding and practice now this became more and more and i think that sometime in the medieval ages uh, even at a time when the church had a lot of influence on the monarchs someone like martin luther who himself was a deep believer you know in christianity yeah he he advocated the secular concept in the sense that he said i think from what i understand that he said the church must not indulge in any executive actions the executive power must rest in the monarchs in the political system and the people should follow the edicts laid down by the monarchs so long as they did not conflict with the law laid down in the scripture so there was a kind of a check and balance so the the church maybe what martin luther advocated was that we take one step back hmm. the, the it will still be run on religious lines but the executive authority rests mostly with um and the kings and the queens and the church will only have a kind of a backup supervisory authority something like what was there in the brahmanical system or or on the vedic system where the kings ruled they had the executive authority but there were emergency situations when the brahmanas found that the kings were not following and they overthrew or they kill even the king sometimes like vena okay yeah so martin luther probably advocated something of that sort but then gradually as time went on as you pointed out then there came various other other uh, opening up of the uh, thought spectrum so to speak and then gradually people started separating uh, religion from the state till it became yes. firmly established and gradually there was a political realignment of systems in the sense that 
monarchy started getting gradually replaced by republics, mm. uh, which were uh, democratic, secular, you know. Uh, so that's the modern. So the modern day uh, state, nation state, <clears throat> mm. which generally started evolving after the French Revolution, that is mostly democratic and secular. Although, of course, there are many examples of theocratic states even now in the modern day world, and also some examples of, uh, uh, of uh, theocratic states that may have some element of democracy. Yeah. But these things started happening from Europe, yes. But <clears throat> if you define uh, the uh, Sanatan Dharma as something that is multi stranded, Hmm. So we see that the kings at that time also uh, had a very broad vision with respect to people following different strands of Sanatan Dharma. Yes. In the, Mahabharat, yeah, in the Mahabharat, when we see the Pandavas go to the forest, now they meet sages from different traditions also. So yes. they, they, they sometimes meet Shaivites and they sometimes meet uh, sages from different orientations. And it described and that that Dhaumya, sorry, described that when they approached Dhaumya to to uh, as to have him as a priest. So it said that Dhaumya was they were pleased to see that Dhaumya had the markings of a Vaishnava, because they themselves were Vaishnavas and the Dhaumya was also Vaishnava. So then they were the gelling also. So that means that there were sages of others' orientations also. Right. So, in a sense, you could say they were secular from one kind of definition of secular, which means that you treat all beliefs equally. Yes. You know, if you look at what modern, uh, this modern <clears throat> secular state is, that you have the freedom to practice your religion, whatever your belief. Mm. Number two, that there will be no... Um, discrimination on the basis of your religious faith. Yes. And number three, that there will be a separation of the state from religious affairs and religious institutions and religious beliefs. Yes. So except for the third one, even in the Vedic times, they followed the first two. Yes. Right? And even amongst all these different schools of Sanatana Dharma, if one may call it that, there was still a broad underlying commonality in terms of the Vedic scriptures. Yes. So that was followed. The problem today is that there is no such underlying common uh, uh, set of books uh, which people of different religious faiths everywhere accept. You see? So in those days, also in the Vedic times, people were, the kings were broad-minded. They allowed... Uh, people of the various elements of Sanatana Dharma to practice. Uh, you come to even, uh, when was that? Ranjit Singh in Punjab must have been around uh, 19th century or something like maybe 1800 something. Now he also gave space for uh, people of all religions. Yes. Right? But he, he, he his, his, uh, governance, his administration, had a strong element of dharma in it. So the third element, which really characterizes secularism today of separation of the church from the state, was not there. So what you are saying is that the state played some role in ensuring that people practice their faith. faith. And also the state gave some push or some facilities for that. So one yes. is, so I think the three elements which you mentioned was that freedom for practicing, impartiality, mm -hmm. but say within impar, you can have impartiality in different ways. Say for example, if, if in today's world we consider sports, say so the government might be impartial in the sense that it supports all sports equally or it can be impartial in the sense that it supports no sport at all and all individuals have to practice on their own so what if i understand right what you're saying is that there was impartiality in the sense that the government would support provide facilities or support various faiths 
Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes. Uh, in the modern context, there are two ways people uh, examine the idea of secularism. They say one type of secularism is that in which the state is completely indifferent to religion. Yes. And the state completely divorces itself from all religious uh, beliefs and practices. Yeah. So uh, the legal system is not based on religious laws, but is based on secularly framed laws in mm -hmm. secular institutions. Uh, at the same time, uh, when these uh, laws were framed, uh, they were implemented equally. So that is one, one type of secularism where the state says that we have nothing to do with religion. Our laws will not have anything to do with religion. And we are not going to make any distinction between people following different religious faiths. Everyone is equal. So all those three elements are followed. That is, the, mm. that is one idea of secularism in the modern day world. The other idea is that the state... Uh, will have no connection in the sense uh, uh, with religious study, uh, with religious beliefs, in that the laws and public life and people in uh, public office uh, will not promote any particular religious faith, but they would support everybody. Mm. They would, they would, uh, it was a kind of a passive encouragement. A passive encouragement towards uh, all religious faiths and an equal vision towards all. Uh, Passive encouragement, would you mean like uh, financial support or uh, or legal facilitation or what are, what are you implying by passive encouragement? It could be that they could, uh, of, maybe in some degree it would be active, but they would not intervene. They would just say, each one of you do your own religion, you practice your own religion. And then in between these two, you have, uh, you have some, apart from these two, you have some others where uh, the state would intervene more actively, even though it called itself secular. And India is, a, is a, a, an interesting case, modern India. Hmm. Because the constitution of India, when it was framed in 1947, it, it got incorporated. Uh, as a republic, when India became a republic, uh, there, there was no word secular. Yes, that is true. In the constitution or in the law books. It only came about as a result of a constitutional amendment sometime in 75 or 76 or something like that. And it was added to the preamble of the constitution without any definition of what the term meant. Yes. The term secular. And the constitution of India itself provides for uh, active involvement of the state in certain aspects of religion. Uh, yes. like especially when it comes to the minorities and so on, you know, protecting yeah. the rights of the minorities, etc. And in some other matters also, in personal laws, for example. Hmm. So there was segregation. There was Hindu law of marriage, in the, you know, for Christians, for Parsis, for, uh, for uh, Muslims, etc. However, the one thing, that, the, the few things that characterized uh, the Indian constitution as secular was that there was no official state religion. Yes. And there was no discrimination on the grounds of religious belief. Hmm. So th there are different shades of secularism in the modern day world. Yes, Maharaj, that's true. You know? And later, perhaps we can discuss what Srila Prabhupada's concept of governance was, and how yeah, he saw, you know, the the modern day secular uh, countries. Yes, Maharaj. So, just you know, I sometimes use these two words. See, originally secularism meant freedom for religion, but now as uh, as you could say, atheism or non-belief has started becoming more influential. Freedom for religion has become freedom from religion. So freedom for religion means that the government should allow everybody to practice whatever they want. 
but freedom from religion means that uh, no religion should have any influence on their particular on on governments on governance so um, the way things have evolved in some ways religion in the secular countries or rather the secular countries the government has to some extent become hostile and usually this hostility within secular countries is seen toward the majority religion whereas in the non secular countries and theocratic countries there is governmental hostility towards the minority religions so for example if if we just consider <clears throat> in america america traditionally was the word god came right in in god we trust was there in it and then we believe that these rights for uh, liberty equality and the pursuit of happiness these are given by the creator so the framers of the constitution american declaration of rights they were all clearly theistic people some people say that they were deistic not exactly theistic but many of them had christian backgrounds and still they wanted to give freedom for people to practice different faiths because one reason was they were protestants and they had come from europe when they were when they had been persecuted over there and when they came and established a state they they wanted freedom from that religious persecution so to some extent um, america became became although christian although uk also uk had a big influence across the world because it colonized large part of the world and uk had a king and it also had a something like a senate where they had the lords being parts and they would be forming a parliament and they would have discussions but you america for example when it became secular initially the religious aspect was quite prominent in it obama was the first president in his presidential address he said that we are a country where you have people of all beliefs and people of no belief can practice so there was an acknowledgement of that and because the idea is secularism if we want it then the pressure group that is likely to exert the most pressure is the majority pressure group because the majority they are in majority and that because of that fear or that aversion that suspicion or that aversion often some strictures were put and this is seen even in india where for example secularism sort of leads to a reverse discrimination against the majority religions so for example as is widely known that you know the minority religions can run their own religious institutions but many hindu temples are controlled by the government and no other religious temples these religions centers of worship are controlled so for, for quite often for opening a hindu temple there is a greater amount of legal hurdles then for opening a muslim or a christian temple so to some extent secularism is this subtle but significant differentiation of freedom for religion to freedom from religion that has led to a a, a reverse discrimination against the majority religion at a subtle level and sometimes at a significant at a gross level also i think the word secularism started off in a noble way right with all good intentions to ensure that religious institutions don't get involved in the uh, shall we say uh, the uh, problems associated with with governance and so on all the religious principles were very much part of the process of governance but the religious institutions were not to be involved directly that was the mm. whole idea right but gradually uh, as godliness started declining as godlessness and atheism started advancing again what we have seen is by left centered or or shall we say left oriented uh, political social and economic philosophies uh, becoming prominent 
the way they advocated and promoted uh, secularism has caused the kind of issues that you have mentioned today. With the result that believers today, especially in, in secular countries, are wary and suspicious of the term secularism because for them, uh, it appears that secularism is a way to uh, kind of uh, promote atheism. It, it's yes, not yes. one thing to say that you won't have uh, you know, a theistic uh, kind of bent to your governance and mm -hmm. that you will not discriminate. But because things are being carried too far, it's come to the point where uh, you, want to, you want to glorify and actually exceptionalize atheism. Yes, so that is one suspicion and wariness that believers have when, it come, when they are living in secular countries. And the second trend that we see is also what you mentioned, that the whole thing of reverse discrimination and where several people have pointed this out about India, that um, in the name of secularism, those professing a leftist ideology have subverted the idea of secularism it is to make it a kind of a, a appeasement for certain sections. Yes. And as a consequence of that, to kind of have a negative view about the majority. Yes. So this true. trend we also see happening in other countries. It's not only about India. Yes. So where, and in countries where there are minorities, in secular countries where there are minorities, the minorities want secularism to protect their rights. Hmm. Right? In, um, whereas those who are uh, influenced by this leftist persuasion, they're trying to move societies in a direction that will basically not only just be pro-minority in any country, because a majority in one country could be a minority in another country. Yes. But I think it's almost a question of promoting atheism and anarchy, anarchism almost. So I think that's something that seems to be happening everywhere where things are blown out of proportion, things not presented in a, in a balanced way, right? Yes. So yes. Prabhupada says at one time that what secularism is doing today is replacing religion with irreligion. Yes, exactly. That is precisely what's happening. So it's one thing to say, you know, the state has nothing to do with religion, but uh, you have to see that religious principles are followed. Srila Prabhupada said that it is a duty of the government to ensure that people follow dharma in whichever kind of faith that they belong to. Hmm. So by saying that a state should be secular, and by advocating that the government should be completely divorced from this, you're actually promoting irreligion. And Srila Prabhupada said that was callous and it was not the way uh, government should be run. Yes, so secularism has, has uh, acquired this kind of perverse uh, connotation today. You know? Yes, Where we get at least the idea that uh, the state should be equally encouraging people of all religious faiths is something that would be acceptable to anybody. Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Right? It's fair. It's liberal. There's no injustice anywhere. Yes, Maharaj. I was just uh, looking at the Wikipedia article on uh, secularism and it gives a series of definitions. I have just done a screen share. Okay. Is it visible now for you also? Yes. So, you know, these are what, the, the various things which we mentioned here. They come up in this. Say, for example, the Oxford Dictionary says the principle of separation of the state from religious institutions. That yes. is at the basic level. The Cambridge yes. Dictionary says the belief 
that religion should not be involved with the ordinary social and political activities of a country. Yes. So, so each of these are like becoming more and more intrusive. It's yes. Like, you see, indifference to or rejection or exclusion of religion and religious considerations. This is the yes. Merriam-Webster. Then a system of social organization and education where religion is not allowed to play a part in civil affairs. That's mm. Collins. So that's, and then a theory, belief, ideology, or politi political modality that demarcates the secular from other phenomena, usually religious, and prioritizes the secular over the non secular in some regard. So basically, what you said that if religion is not allowed to play a part, then eventually it will become that its religion is being promoted. Yes, yes. Should I you continue the share screen? You wanted to comment something on that? Yeah, because uh, absence of promoting one thing uh, results in promoting the opposite. Yes. Uh, let me give you an, an example. When I was at one program in Australia some years ago, at the end of the lecture, one gentleman asked me that why is it important uh, to uh, give some nice values to children according to our beliefs? We should just let them develop as they feel fit when they, they grow up and then, you know, they let them discover and find out. Mm. Uh, why should we groom them in a particular way? So I said, look, if you don't groom them in your way, somebody else is going to do the grooming their way. <laughs> yes, that is so there is, a, there is a default setting in the world outside. So if you don't give certain types of values to your children, when your children go to the outside world, in the school, with their friends, and so on, then they're going to automatically, by default, imbibe the values that they see and experience there. Yeah. You see, it's automatically going to happen. So by trying to appear liberal and saying, I will not impose any views on my children, what you're actually doing is forcibly imposing the views of the outside world on your children. <laughs> yes. So you're letting somebody else, the default mode, take over and indoctrinate your children. So similarly, when we try to have an exclusivist kind of a paradigm, by which I mean that you want to have a way of, of uh, acting or thinking where you exclude religion and spirituality from not just governance and laws, but from public affairs, from civic affairs. You don't want uh, any mention of it in your educational curricula and so on and so forth. Mm. Then what you do in effect, perhaps, perhaps consciously and in some cases maybe unconsciously as well, that you are actually promoting the opposite of religion. And this I see as the purport of what Prabhupada said, that if you don't promote religion, you actually end up promoting irreligion. So naturally, yes. in the absence of the forces of properly uh, practiced and explained and understood religious principles, there's a vacuum. And the vacuum is very quickly taken up by lower forces of materialism, atheism, anarchism, Yes, and they will fill the void and they will go and indoctrinate uh, people at large. Yes. This is the flaw in all these different definitions. So when you, so I'll come back to my sutra that I said, the absence of promoting something effectively ends up promoting the opposite. Yes, that's precisely true. Right? Now, I recently got a shocking uh, realization of this. Now, one of my relatives, very intelligent, well-educated from a Brahmin family and is an engineer. And we were talking and he said, uh, we were discussing and he told me that, he said, I want, the, I want the Bhagavat. I want the Bhagavat in Sanskrit to read. And then I gave it to him. And then he asked me, 
hey, this seems to be a different book. I said, you wanted the Bhagavad? He said, I wanted the Bhagavad Gita. You wanted the Bhagavad Gita or the Bhagavatam? Yes, what is the difference between the two? So now <laughs> he's a he's he's not he's not a like a Hindu ignorant person. He's a well known so he's a he's a Brahmin. There are rituals that happen in his life, and he's not by any means a atheistic or a materialistic kind of person. He's quite religious, but then it's almost like in India, uh, by calling something a secular, we have we have deprived entire generations of even basic knowledge what to speak of any practices basic knowledge yeah. of our own traditions so even if we don't want to even if at a governmental level we don't want to uh, accept certain books as revelations but at least as books of wisdom or as books of literature that have emerged and that have influenced our our civilization so it's vital so similarly, so the same, similarly in the West, the people knew the Bible. The last two generations are among the people who just don't know anything about the Bible at all. Because there's an increasing uh, elimination of religion from the public sphere. Yes. In fact, there was a popular movie. It is based on some real life incidents. That is, they call it, it's, it's a series, just like there is Netflix for Ordinary movies, there is something called pure flicks, which Christians have prepared, and they're all Christian movies. So they have prepared a series of movies called God is Not Dead. So in one of them, the, the case they depict, and again, this is based on real life, that there is this English teacher who wants to talk about some values. And she says how these values were talked about by Martin Luther, how they were taught Martin Luther King, and they were talked by Jesus. And then there are some atheistic parents who say that, why is the school teaching about Jesus? So she says, I am not talking about Jesus as a religious figure and giving religious teachings. I'm talking about him simply as a historical figure who wrote something, who gave taught something. And those values are similar to what Martin Luther King has taught. But then she is expelled from her school and then there is a big case and prominent attorneys come in. And at the end, it is shown that at least they try to establish the historicity of Jesus. And based on that, they try to, uh, she's reinstated. But the point is that there is like a deliberate rejection of even basic literary legacy in by calling it as religious. Yes. You know this word deracination? Yes. Vaccinated. What what the secularization of the world is doing is to deracinate people. Deracinate means to uh, uproot people from their cultures and their religious and spiritual beliefs. Essentially, to make them godless. You know. So that is what secularism is ending up doing. So, yes, unfortunately, uh, there is such a, a fear about what um, religion does or what could do, and almost a kind of a hostility, and a, you know, uh, towards that. That at the very mention of it, they just revolt. Yeah. In every country or in most countries, it's happening like that. You know, so. We are ending up using generations of deracinates who have absolutely no clue. And what happens is that when you remove religion in general from the public sphere, it, it disappears from the public consciousness, but it also disappears from the private consciousness. And therefore, uh, the higher aspects of each religion, things like uh, the goal of life or certain values that uh, need to be uh, inculcated in all human beings. All these things are lost. So the generations that come up one after the other, then are absolutely have no moorings in any, any cultural values, any spiritual values. 
they they're just like rudderless ships out in the stormy mm-hmm. oceans of this uh, material world you know and and therefore this is a field day for all con- types of concocted uh, modern uh, atheistic uh, philosophies to flourish anything yes. goes and anyone starts any philosophy and that becomes fashionable it becomes uh, you know an, an excessively liberal kind of uh, thing and you know we should just encourage individual room and lights unlimitedly personal rights should be unlimitedly encouraged and so on so the the whole idea that human life should be disciplined there should be a certain higher goal for which we aspire so all of these things are completely lost because of uh, this excessive emphasis on uh, uh, secularization yes maharaj in fact mm, richard dawkins in his book god delusion and some of the other prominent atheists sam harris and others richard dawkins has tried to say that parents trying to teach religion to their children should be classified as child abuse and he says that now of course you know for anything extreme examples can be given and he gives examples of how say for example in in some places in pakistan or afghanistan or in the middle east especially he gives examples that children are indoctrinated into hate towards other faiths and then they they become breeding grounds for intolerance and violence so he he and some other say that in that sense till a child is grown up enough to have the critical ability to evaluate faith claims the child should not be taught anything that is their argument but the problem with that is now of course there are extremes but now those extremes are few and on the fringe and in general <coughs> uh, religion does encourage positive values kindness charity self control and <coughs> long term thinking freedom from greed or craving or anger so there is a lot of positive values that are learned and not just values are learned but there are practices which can we can say in our tradition as samskaras which help actually the development of those values so there is some valid concern and this brings us to another point that i mean you can respond to that but i just make the next point also that even within secularism the government has to keep certain level of regulation so at least in america now the rule is that if any religions faith practices interfere with people's physical health then they will not be allowed so for example there are some extreme evangelist uh, christians who say that if you just accept jesus as your savior then you will be free from all your problems and if you still have any problems that means that you're not really with faith accepted jesus as a savior so for example if some person has glasses and if you accept jesus as your savior your eyes will be fully healed and you will not need any more glasses so what happened because of that some young people now there many evangelicals are quite active in in um, in universities so the young people would give up their glasses because they wanted to show they had faith but then they would bump into bump into others they just couldn't see so that could be one guideline where you know if people's health is being exploited then people's health is being uh, affected adversely then the state has to interfere at some level so there is to some extent valid concern that people should not be indoctrinated into beliefs that are harmful to society or harmful to themselves but to characterize to equate religion with extremism is actually manipulation is emotional manipulation of people hmm? yes actually in the idea that a sec- modern secular states allow people the full freedom to practice their religions uh, is always circumscribed by certain restrictions because all modern constitutions accept that no freedoms are absolute 
there will always be some limits to every freedom. Even in India, you mentioned the case of the US. I'm not familiar with uh, that, but in India, uh, the freedom to practice religion is there under a certain article of the constitution. And there also there is a limit. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, I think uh, morality and uh, um, health and some, some other criteria they have put down like that. So there are limits naturally. So the, the way that modern, secular, democratic nation states are set up is that they try to give as much freedom as possible to their constituents, to that is to their citizens. But naturally for the larger common good and also to ensure that, uh, as you said, they don't harm themselves, then there are certain restrictions posed. Hmm. You know, so that is, that is there in, in uh, I think that is right as well. You know, if somebody is doing things in such a way that causes a disturbance in the society and even within their community, if it is considered to be exploitative, etc. Now, uh, as far as there are things to say about this aspect also, but I'll, I'll also talk about the other thing you said, which is that uh, the example of Richard Dawkins saying that uh, because there were a few cases of very bad indoctrination in certain mm. countries, that we should prohibit children being uh, you know, taught religion at all. That is like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a very fallacious and uh, intellectually inadequate argument. It's like saying that in a particular school, some teachers you know, taught the wrong things to the students, therefore you should close down all schools. You should close yeah. down the edu entire educational system should be closed down. You know, we it's something like that. that. We could use that specifically for science and technology also. Yes, you know, sometimes yes. some kids can use some electrical gadgets and hard harm themselves, or they could yeah. use some gadgets and harm others. Sometimes yes. they might learn some things by which they can make some explosives. So do we, yes. do we ban scientific education because of that? Correct. So th those arguments hold no water, actually. But the real crux of the matter is that when you prohibit religious instruction totally, uh, then what you are prohibiting is not just a set of rituals, but also a whole set of values, a whole set of attitudes, and some higher goals and aspirations and ideals in life. The problem arises when people who teach religion do not understand the spiritual and the devotional and the sublime elements of their religion. And they focus more on the external aspects, on the materialistic aspects, and they have a very narrow and faulty definition or understanding of religious principles. And they equate uh, you know, certain practices with the fundamentals of the teachings. And they also promote hatred, they teach hatred. Now that is very much unacceptable. Mm. So yes, that is a fact that in many places people do teach hatred to the children and even to adults. And that is as something objectionable and condemnable and should, they should be hauled up and, and, you know, dealt with appropriately in the courts of law. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that is all there is to religion. If you remember last time, uh, we were talking about uh, the different uh, uh, spiritual but not religious, yes, SBNR. Yes. Uh, I was mentioning there that there are two types of religion. One is materialistic religion, the other is spiritual religion. So every religion has these two aspects. Hmm. You know? And uh, a true knower of religion must know both and must be able to distinguish between both and must be able to establish and pro promote primarily the spiritual element. So when people do not understand or do not sufficiently focus on the spiritual element or they have not imbibed the spirit 
of those higher teachings and they uh, uh, they take recourse to the baser, so to speak, mm. uh, uh, instincts of humanity to, to come as a group and then hate the other person. So that obviously can't be done. So this is the response to the two points you mentioned. One is about the, the arguments that people like Dawkins make about not teaching religion to children. Yeah. Right, and the other one, what was the first one we... Should uh, the government need some amount of intervention, some amount of yeah, regulation? Some governmental interference or restrictions, the government will place some restrictions. Now the controversies that come up here in the modern day world are that what is perceived as uh, an interference by some are construed by others to be harmful and violative of of very basic human rights. Yes. So this kind of a tussle uh, will go on for some time, at least. Yes, much. I think specifics will have to be negotiated according to time, place, circumstance. Say, yes. for example, in America, the Amish, they don't take health insurance. And normally, people are expected to take health insurance and they, normally doctors will also not really uh, Health insurance is expected to have for everyone to have, but then they have their own community kind of health insurance where the tithe that they do is saved with the bishop or the local authorities and then that is used for any medical emergencies among people. So yes, so some amount of variability will be there according to time, place, circumstance about what level of regulation should be there or what level should not be there. So now moving on to if we... So we discussed about how secularism has emerged and then you also you discussed in India as well as in the West. And then now if you look at how our, the bhakti tradition, in, we could look at the broad dharmic tradition or we could look at specifically the bhakti tradition, how it has interacted in the past and how it has interacted in the present. So broadly, we, uh, I will start with right now and then we'll move backward if required. So as far as we can see the Krishna consciousness movement, when Srila Prabhupada started it, there were, <clears throat> there were the secular countries like America, UK and others. Then there were the Middle East, which were Islamic theocratic. And then there was the, the Soviet bloc, which was communist atheistic. So Prabhupada had the, or in general our movement has had the maximum opportunity to share and practice in the secular countries. Hmm. And then in both in the Marxist as well as in the Islamic countries, Islamic theocracy, I don't think there's any Christian theocracy anywhere right now, uh, where in the world as of now, as far as I can, uh, as far as I check it out. So in the Islamic theocratic countries, we were not able to really reach out uh, to the, to the, local population there to the Muslims and and similarly within the Marxist countries the communist countries also it was very difficult there was a lot of persecution of devotees and still devotees tried to keep practicing underground and now with the, the liberalization of the Soviet countries now there is uh, there is a greater facility to practice and there is significant upsurge of devotees but still Russia is not I, although there are elections and it's nominally a democracy, but it's not it's, uh, as secular or as democratic as the Western world. And still there are, there are significant levels of opposition in some places like Kazakhstan or even in Russia, in Moscow, our temple was opposed. So there was uh, the, the Russian government is very closely aligned with the ROC, the Russian Orthodox Church. And that's like a third branch of Christianity apart from the Catholics and the Protestants. They broke off very early in the 10th century. The Protestant break happened in the 16th century. So broadly, now we'll come to India later, but broadly it seems for in today's world scenario, for the practice and the propagation of bhakti, uh, the secular environment seems to be the most conducive. In the Islamic countries, we are there is some amount of Krishna bhakti being practiced, but that is only among the Indian immigrants. And there has to be a strict demarcation there cannot be any outreach to any of the local population. 
and even now in china hinduism itself is not recognized so there is some amount of practice but it is mostly underground and it is uh, mostly through the yoga or kirtan not directly bhakti or hinduism as such. so that's like a overview right now any thoughts on this yes um obviously um theocratic states that are opposed to the way we practice krishna consciousness or to any other religious or spiritual belief are not uh, favorable places in which to do our bhakti similarly as you said the communist states are also or former communist states some of them hmm. are not so favorable where there is a very strong religious lobby belonging to another denomination there may be issues there too so uh, a krishna conscious country is obviously the best yes she the hope by the hope that there could be some countries in future that could become krishna conscious like mauritius or something like that hmm. uh, the one country that is uh, used to be rather a hindu country is now more or less for all uh you know practical purposes become a communist state that's uh, nepal yes uh, i think bhutan is still a officially hindu country but no, it's, it's a buddhist country bhutan yes oh buddhist read... it's buddhist oh is it i read it as there are buddhist theocracies but they are mild theocracies they are not as rigid okay. as others uh the islamic theocracies are rigid and they except for a few countries like malaysia and so on they don't allow you to practice your religion openly yes um otherwise the buddhist theocracies are mostly the southeast asian countries some of them they are more liberal and open and they will allow you to practice but i think the best bet so they are also somewhat secular actually <clears throat> Yeah, so you're right. So in the current context, the best bet are the secular countries. <clears throat> yeah. um, so I think we should appreciate the fact that that is there. That and many of our devotees living in other countries are able to get the benefit of the freedoms there to practice Krishna consciousness. Hmm. You know, in many cases. because they are a minority they are also helped by the local governments with financial aid sometimes or in some other way <clears throat> so definitely yes the question of how uh, we should be in a secular country as devotees that is i think a question we need to discuss now yes maharaj before we go into that should we discuss a little bit more about india yeah sure sure yeah so now one thing is maybe we could have get some indication of what Pra prabhupad wanted uh, for india through what he wanted to discuss with indira gandhi when he met her <laughs> <laughs> so that might not be relevant in today's world but uh, as you said earlier india was dharmic and that meant that there was a facility for different people to practice their dharma but at least some level of dharma was practiced so without going into the all the points that prabhupad wanted uh, in his letter but prabhupad talked about basically two things what i saw mainly one is some amount of regulative practices like the regulative principles some amount of practice of those principles that should be uh, that should be in a sense uh imposed or at least regulated by the government and prabhupada also said that there should be chanting of the holy names and uh, that should be encouraged and facilitated by the government now specifically we didn't go into the uh, prabhupada uh, recommended a particular form of government also but with respect to the facility for practicing i find that the regulative principles if we present no 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 that can seem a little intrusive for people but if we present them as positive idea that this is they are related with mercy cleanliness truthfulness then those are values which are in one <laughs> sense 
universal values that uh, so to some extent the government needs to promote virtues at least prabhu that's what prabhupad wanted so the practices which will diminish virtues prabhupad wanted those to be regulated and the practices are you there maharaj yeah yes yes and the practices that will promote or enhance virtues like say kirtans that prabhupad wanted them to be practiced so i uh, i don't know how how much that is possible in today's scenario in today's indian political scenario but i thought i'll just mention that and if you would like to say anything about that um personally when i speak uh, to people who are not devotees and if i happen to speak about uh stopping eating meat <clears throat> then i mostly focus on the idea of meat eating being uh, very cruel hmm. the principle of cruelty and that is not becoming of a civilized society so that is the whole thrust although there are so many arguments to give in favor of vegetarianism you know there's a the economic argument there is the uh, environmental argument there are you know so many other type health argument mm. so many arguments. and all of these are definitely valid but i think today in the world that is trying to move towards what they consider liberal values uh, the idea that you know you are um, practicing cruelty enormous humongous cruelty by killing so many millions and millions of animals every single day and causing so much pain to them <clears throat> just for the satisfaction of your tongue that is an approach rather th- that could work rather than s- because it's a valid approach it's we also believe that and that is really why we don't eat meat yeah uh and we don't bring religion into the picture really we just talk about this but uh the way shila prabhupada of course if you uh, in the lila prabhupada lila amrit i remember reading that uh Satsurup Maharaj says that there was some notes in Shri Prabhupada's diary about what he wanted to speak to when he met Indira Gandhi. Yeah. And some of them were like um, all the members of parliament should be second initiated brahmanas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all the uh, <clears throat> officers in the government should go for kirtan twice a day. You know, things like that. <clears throat> and then meat eating should could be allowed in private but not in public so there were several things like that yes but if you look at the other things that prabhupada said you know for modern democracies uh it was that number one being totally hands off from religion being mm. totally divorced from religion was in his words callous you cannot a state cannot do that hmm? so that's the first thing hmm. the second thing was that he said <clears throat> the state should be equally disposed to all religions religious faiths so no discrimination so all hmm. are equal but the third thing he said was that not only should you be neutral that neutrality is not some uh, passive encouragement and this is these are my words passive encouragement but he said the neutrality doesn't mean uh, you just say okay you can do whatever you like and just hands off but you should actually encourage them positively to do it and you should it is your responsibility as a government to see that a hindu practices his regulations religious regulations a christian does follow the christian rules and muslims follow the muslim rules you know so he he said that very clearly um uh, also i think he said that the first duty of a government is to <clears throat> promote god consciousness to ensure that the citizens uh will be saved from hellish conditions of life and will move make 
or towards spiritual perfection. Mm. You know, so this became like a bounden duty of uh, governments to do that. And he also finally said that governments must be headed by saintly people. You know, so... Headed or advised? Headed or advised? The heads of government as well as the advisors. Okay. So therefore, you have a concept of Raj Rishi, right? The saintly king. Yes. Now, today you may not have monarchies, so you have the equivalent head of state, whether it's the prime minister or the president or whatever. Hmm. But whoever is in power, whoever wields the reins of power, should be a saintly person. That's the point Srila Prabhupada made. Now, everything that Srila Prabhupada said may not be acceptable to, to modern thinking, you know. But at least we have a, a, a conceptual idea of what ideal governance should be. <clears throat> and in that respect, as devotees, at least we are uh, free to practice whatever we want. And because it's a democracy, so if the number of people who practice uh, a certain denomination increase, the natural they will have a bigger say. Yes. In the way it's run. Uh, for example, I, I live in the state of Karnataka. And I remember that uh, when a particular party came to power some years ago, uh, they, start, they, they set up a rule to abolish cow slaughter or something like that. <clears throat> something favoring cow protection. So somehow or the other, that that government didn't continue. So another government came in. And the first thing that next government did was to overrule that earlier law. (laughs) Mm, Yes. So, you know, and by the way, cow protection is enshrined in the Constitution of India. Although it is not been made compulsory, it's, it's called a directive principle, which means that it is something that and the government is very strongly encouraged to do within a reasonable frame of time, but it is not compulsory, meaning that you can't take the government to court uh, at this time to say, why haven't you implemented that? Mm. But if it's a fundamental right to life or right to property or some of the other fundamental rights, <clears throat> if that is being violated, then you can take the government to court. Yes, so we... Uh, can keep in mind what Srila Prabhupada said. We also keep in mind the modern context in which we live and try to see how best we can practice Krishna consciousness. And in this respect, uh, the modern secular democracy seems to be the best uh, options for us. Hmm. Given that we don't have any Krishna conscious uh, states anywhere. Yes, Maharaj. Now, that is a... So, Prabhupada, often on specific contexts, he made specific statements. Other, other contexts, he has made other statements also. So, we will need to, based on the context we live in, find out what is relevant and what is best applicable. So, now, coming to that point, I think, last point about how, within a secular context, we can practice or we can share our our bhakti practices so if we just consider the history of our movement something you know when we were initially we went to the west we were often classified as a cult especially in america and some other countries also and i was talking with anuttama prabhu and he told me he is quite actively into interfaith activity so he told me that while the while we had our we were targeted by some anti-cult groups and other things, what helped us get that anti-cult label off the back was not just our own presentations, but also many Christian groups came to help us. Because Christian groups came and supported that this is actually authentic religion. And of course, they had a reason at that time, because they were also at a certain level apprehensive that um, if a particular kind of practice is declared as illegal or forbidden, Today, 
tomorrow another kind of practice can also be declared and then our religion can also be affected by that so to some extent uh, we need to be a part of the broader community and there has to be some discourse some connection with the broader community some awareness some dyna some dynamic interaction we can't live like in our own bubbles so of course in if somebody is uh, living a cloistered or a sequestered life in a farm then maybe living in some amount of bubble is possible but in general for most devotees who in our our movement is now mostly congregation based so we will we can talk about two things one is how as a movement means the movement leaders the temple leaders or the temple communication department or how they present in a secular world and then as devotees individually <clears throat> in their professions or their children or what they learn in schools and how they can be taught values the two distinct things which maybe we will we can discuss and that can be broadly in the western part of the world or i don't know whether non india and india can be a cl classification but generally that would be a we can discuss these things yeah i think whether we live in a secular modern secular democracy or we live in a in a theocracy where the main religion is hostile to our beliefs mm. or whether we really live in a any other country which is hostile to our beliefs at a private level our practice of krishna consciousness must go on that's the first and most important point yes we cannot stop uh, believing krishna is the supreme personality of godhead or we cannot stop chanting hari krishna because the government is opposed to it but then we're not talking about these hostile countries although many of our devotees do live in such countries but for them yes privately we have to continue our practices when it comes to the secular modern democracies i would say that we have much more freedom to not only privately practice but also publicly practice mm. so which means we can have temples we can have festivals we can have public gatherings we can on occasion go out into the streets you know we can distribute books we can do hari naam sankirtan on the streets uh, we can have rath yatra festivals on the streets and in public places etc so that we can continue to do because the states permit us to do that so to the degree that the states permit us we should do it number 1 uh, then the next point is that uh, where the states impose some restrictions due to certain kinds of laws as practicing devotees we should respect those restrictions and follow them for example to do rath yatra you know in the in the western countries or even in india for example we just can't have a rath yatra a huge rath yatra without any permissions from the police and the city council and you know all of that and sometimes the authorities may tell you no you can't do it on such and such date because this is a problem you do it on you can do it any other day or so on so we will follow their guidelines we cannot say well freedom of religion and therefore you must allow me and you know uh, do something some something that will cause a disturbance so we should respect the laws of the state in which we live even though they may impose some restrictions on us uh however if the restrictions that are imposed upon our belief and practice of krishna consciousness in a modern secular democracy is of such a nature that it infringes our fundamental rights and we feel strongly that those restrictions are unconstitutional and unreasonable mm -hmm. then we also have the facility to approach uh the courts you know or the police or whatever it is so the authorities or the political establishment so we can do that if it is really required you know yes. but in general we should 
we should be cautious that we are respectful of uh, state authorities and state regulations and function within that. Another important point I would say is that because modern secular democracies tend to become, tend to be liberal and it's becoming increasingly so, there may be many things that the state permits, but our beliefs don't permit. So, for example, abortion. The state may say it's fine to good abortion from this month to this month, you know, you can do that. But we don't believe that abortion can be done, even if the state allows it. Mm. So the fact that the secular state permits you to do something is not justification for us to do it. For us, the justification is if the, uh, our shastras, if our philosophy permits it. Right? Yes. So we can, you can visualize two, two overlapping circles. One circle represents the state laws and regulations, mm. and the other, the Shastric laws and the Krishna conscious beliefs and practices. Okay? So okay. we can publicly practice to the degree that uh, the two overlap. So, yeah, so, so then you have a Venn diagram. Oh, 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 uh, overlapping circles, yeah, yeah a Venn diagram, and one for the state laws, the other for uh, our beliefs in terms mm -hmm. of the Shastra, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. And definitely the overlapping section is what we can freely do. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be another section that is permitted by the state law, but because it doesn't coincide with the Shastra, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Right? And there may be certain things that are mandated by scripture, but are not permitted by the okay. state law. So we don't do it. For example, now in India, there's a, there's a big issue that Rathyatra must be celebrated only on the particular tithi on which it is celebrated in Jagannath Puri hmm. and which is dated in the scripture. So we have the freedom, fortunately, in India uh, to do it on that day. Mostly the governments would give us permission, there wouldn't be a problem. But in countries, other countries, it may not be the case. Mm. They may say, no, we can't allow you to do it on this day. We can't say it's my fundamental right and you have to allow me. And that will just cause some difficulty. So even though our Shastra says that Rathi Yatra can be, should be celebrated on this day, but it is not a mandatory thing that you have to celebrate Rathi Yatra. You can do it privately. So even where uh, there are certain uh, things that are uh, permitted by the Shastra, um, we can do that privately. If it is mandated by the Shastra that you have to do it, and there is some opposition from the state to that, then we'll have to just do that privately. Yes, ma'am. Of course, uh, but when it comes to certain things, uh, you know, obviously, uh, if it is going to be seen as harmful to health, to public morality, to decency, to uh, law and order, and such and such and such, that we shouldn't even do that. Yes. You know, for example, you know there may be a history of uh, a, of some cases, exceptional cases, right? Like uh, uh, Ramdas of Adrachalam or one of the Alwars who actually um, diverted some money that was meant for other purposes to, to construct temples and so on. Yes? Mm. So even though from a transcendental point of view, you know, somebody may say, well, it's okay, we're doing it for Krishna, but because we're living in a, a, a nation state which has certain laws, we should yeah. be very careful that we don't do such things, that we act within the ambit of the law. Yes. And that we don't do anything that will uh, incur, let us say, penal action against us by the state, because this will bring us into disrepute. It will harm our practice and preaching of Krishna consciousness. And it may also give devotees in general the wrong idea that we have a blanket permit to do anything we like when it comes to such things. Yes.
polygamy could be another example yes <laughs> that is there in our tradition but most countries now have outlawed it yes so, regarding this this is quite a illustrative venn diagram and uh, what what you earlier talked about the leftists using uh, using secularism to impose often their own ideologies on the world this is happened in the west <laughs> <but> not it <coughs> happened to that extent in india so for example now when the lockdown was there in america certain services were deemed essential and they were allowed <coughs> and planned parenthood which is actually a euphemism for abortion planned parenthood yes. is organization now the abortion services were considered mandatory and they were considered essential and they were allowed to go on and in fact there are some sisters of charity like there in mother teresa was there there are christian organizations which also take care of women so now there is a court case going on that because abortion is now presented as female reproductive rights so they even they are being forced to have uh, to give that kind of support in their clinics so it is possible that left can intrude and it can create problems there are cases of there is a currently ongoing case as a christian baker <coughs> <coughs> one of their main businesses is say weddings wedding cakes but they said that a christian baker said that you know when there is a gay marriage gay marriage is against our beliefs and we cannot provide a <coughs> for that and then he was penalized for that and his business was shut down so there could be areas where the government might become more and more intrusive that means the government may force us to do certain things which are against our beliefs <coughs> and that might lead to situations where devotees will have to choose their battles <coughs> so a couple of scenarios where uh where I, i would like to present i have encountered some devotees that are taking the place say for example if somebody is working in medical research and then they have to do animal testing and without doing animal testing they can't get even their degree or they can't uh, grow in their career so it's like a government or a legal requirement for them or other could be that uh, somebody is using somebody is developing some software and that software can be used to say you know efficiently process uh, how animals are being slaughtered so say so that say so animal slaughtering unit has asked for a software to be made for their uh, for their particular program so now this Or is of course be a gynecologist who is forced to do abortions otherwise he or she won't get the degree yeah i think that's a quite a much more direct example i would say but so now these are these are hmm. i would say it's, it's i'm within the ambit of secularism so how would you recommend devotees to deal with such situations i think say these are all cases of cruelty right yeah because whether it's animals or whether it's humans or whatever so as i mentioned earlier that the approach i am trying to take and i am in the process of writing some articles in abortion and uh, the theme of the that i the approach that i'm taking is to point out how cruel it is and eventually i hope that we can approach the authorities because now abortion is enshrined in indian law you know and it's enshrined in the in the society as well there are millions of abortions happening every year in india 
So I, I think that we can approach um, the media, we can approach the public, we can approach the courts, etc., presenting our case from a purely secular point of view. So that is going to be my approach towards my anti-abortion strategy. I'm not going to mention anything religious, although uh, our convictions uh, for all these things uh, do have uh, foundation in religious uh, scriptures. But these things won't stand in a court of law. A court of law in a modern secular democracy will not say, uh, well, we should stop abortion because your religion, or we should outlaw abortion because your religion says so. The, the law won't accept that because that's the way secular democracies and constitutions are framed. But we have to appeal uh, to people's intelligence with respect to secular values. We have to give them logic. So for example, my approach for abortion is going to be that I'm not going to invoke any religious principles or any scripture, or I'm not even going to mention the word God. But my argument to illustrate or to, to uh, demonstrate that abortion is something that is totally wrong is uh, my four criteria will be number one, logic and reason. Number two, science. Number three, law. And number four, basic human ethics. So I'm going to take only these four. I'm not even going to touch religion. Because the moment you bring in religion, then it becomes an opportunity for opponents to uh, divert the whole topic to something else and hijack the whole discussion in a way that becomes very confrontational and vituperative and all sorts of other things. So better to just keep religion out of it in these matters and just argue on totally secular grounds. Because nowadays, uh, there is so much suspicion and so on about arguments on religious grounds. You know, it just becomes a red herring. So better to just move it out for the time being. You know, even though religion does play uh, an important role in such things. Similarly, for animal testing, instead of saying, you know, it's against my religious beliefs, let's appeal to the instinct of the modern secular liberal who says, you know, we should be kind, we should be compassionate. That's mm -hmm. what they're talking about. So say, yes, how does this fit in with your uh, value of kindness and compassion? How are you being kind when you're slaughtering so many animals? So in this way, we, we uh, utilize correctly uh, certain values that we also believe in very strongly. And there is a commonality these are values that we believe in and the modern secular liberal, liberals also believe in. So we can yeah. focus on these values and try to uh, speak about what we believe in strongly and advocate our point of view. This is very significant. That means that there are some places where quoting our sources like scripture will bring authority. Bring, uh, bring, but there are other places where quoting scripture will actually take away our authority. It so, will be counterproductive. It will be counterproductive, yes. Now, of course, within this also, there are uh, certain things. Say, for example, now Muslims demand the right to say Muslim women wear hijab. And that is, in most secular countries, it is allowed. And of course, now it has also become like a fashion thing for some people. But the idea is that it seems at an individual level, cultural practices, if somebody says this is a part of my tradition, there is some room where it can be allowed. But uh, beyond that, so I met one devotee, this, this actually the same devotee who was in software and who had to do this program. This was in Australia, I met this devotee and he tried to oppose, he said, this is against my faith to write a program which involves uh, which is slaughtering of animals. <laughs> so then what was told was that 
apparently he took it to the australian ethics or whatever committee or whatever so they said that you know if it is with respect to your dress or your lifestyle if your company puts some restrictions on you that is considered violation but if it's with respect to the job that they are telling you to do now they are paying you for that so we can't intervene in that at a mutual level you can talk with your of your boss and if they allow you to do some other project that's fine but if they that's the job you are if within the job profile they are asking you to do something we can't intervene so i think at an individual level there might be some variation if what somebody might be able to do <laughs> like somebody might be able to say that animal testing is against my faith and it might be allowed but i think this is a, at a broader level a cruelty free activity is something which does appeal to people of course among this abortion is problematic because somehow the world has become so polarized that if they, they, the way in the media it is that if you support abortion it's that you hate babies and if you oppose abortion it's like you hate women that's the way it has been portrayed <laughs> it's not like that but it's not that there is any hatred toward women but the society has become structured in such a way and the milieu has been created that abortion would be like a especially tough nut uh, for devotees to tackle i know here in the bhaktivant hospital we have a strict uh, policy of not doing abortions and there are some countries i know in south africa also there was a devotee who was a gynecologist and she said that this is against my faith and they allowed her but that was almost two decades ago but now whether it would be that easily possible but i but these are so you said logic and reason science ethics and uh, <laughs> law that is quite a sound strategy and yeah. actually you see this whole concept when you talked it in connection with abortion that these two uh either if you are for abortion you are against the child and if you are um anti abortion then you are against a woman you know that that's not exactly the case you know it's it's uh, if you are for abortion you're definitely against children that's the fact but if you're anti abortion it doesn't mean you are against women so and being anti abortion on one hand equals uh, anti woman on the other hand this is a false equivalence it's a fallacious argument so here uh, as you mentioned that abortion today is made out to be a case of uh women's reproductive rights mm. but the way we would present it is that yes we are not against um the human rights of women we we are not at all against human rights of any kind on the on contrary our case is all about human rights but it is about human rights of the unborn human child so we are for human rights we are not against human rights so by saying that abortion is wrong we are not saying women should be deprived of rights we are not anti women but what we are saying is that children must be given their rights the unborn child must be given its rights and we also argue that uh where in where there is a question of rights a multiplicity of rights there is also a question of gradation of hierarchy of weightage of rights not all rights carry the same weight for example the right to life is obviously the heaviest of all the rights fundamental rights mm. you know if my fundamental right of speech affects your life then that speech has to be restricted it that's cannot why there be are hate speech laws Hey, yeah, anti hate speech laws are there. Yeah, because yes, yeah, that's true. Right. So therefore, right to life is the topmost. <clears throat> so when you say that you are for a woman's reproductive rights, all right, 
but not at the cost of somebody else's life. Hmm. You cannot have your fundamental rights, your reproductive rights, by killing somebody else. And that child is somebody else. Even though that child is, is in your womb, is your child, and is going to be dependent on you for nine months and even after that, but that doesn't mean that you have any claim or any right of proprietorship to kill that child. So here, this is the kind of argument we should be making. Yes. We should f destroy this false equivalence that because you're pushing uh, for anti-abortion stands that you are against women. We must demolish this false equivalence and take secular arguments and tell them no. that you know, right to life is the most sacrosanct in any modern secular democracy. And our case is that this right to life for the unborn child must be preserved and protected. Yes, Maharaj. See, actually what has happened, I fully agree with you. And I, I myself don't accept the equivalence that anti-abortion is anti-woman at all. But that is the way it is presented. And historically how it was that uh, in the past, say, uh, you know, when people, even, even 40, 50 years ago, then say if a man and a woman would unite and if a woman would become pregnant, if then it was outside marriage, then there were what were called as shotgun marriages. Shotgun marriages is the idea that the father of the girl would stand with a gun behind that man that, you know, you have to take responsibility now. So in a sense, when there was a social ethos of stable marriages and the ethos of responsibility was there at that time, Abortions, of course, abortion technology was also not there. I read one, um, one socio-technological like, uh, writer. He said that there are three inventions which have changed modern society. This one is weapons of mass destruction. Second is the internet. And uh, modern, I can say postmodern almost. Uh, internet and third is the birth control pill. So the whole intervention of... Uh, for women to be able to control their reproduction. So originally, because there was an the ethos of taking responsibility, and even in the in the in Europe, if we consider, sometimes uh, kings would have uh, kings or nobility would have uh, extramarital license, but they would also take responsibility for their what the word was byblos, or uh, that kind of children. But as marriage itself started becoming de uh, destabilized. So multiple things have happened in today's world where you know, often it is almost like a social pressure on a woman in order to find a mate to offer herself physically to the man without, without even marriage. And then because of that, it is then later on, pregnancy if it happens then there is we cannot so we cannot isolate abortion from the broader social context that when women are in a place where why is a woman in a place where she actually wants to abort a child that is not just solely because of her indiscreet choices yes that is true but there is a lot of pressure uh, on women to, so in some ways, the sexual licentiousness or sexual revolution that is called, that has actually made, um, made women more sexually vulnerable and they have to make themselves more sexually available to others. So without that, often the relationships don't move forward. So in that context, simply mandating that abortion is wrong, without considering the broader context because of which a woman have come to a level where they want abortion or they need abortion. That is a broader yeah. macro question which also has to be considered. So I'm not supporting it anyway. I'm just saying that why it is portrayed as anti-women because it is, it is like a man unites with a woman and then the child having the child is primarily the woman's responsibility. She has to uh, carry the child for nine months and then she has to and often the, the financial responsibility and everything all that comes up 
later so in that sense in today's context it has become like that of course abortion is a big subject and we could discuss separately but i was just yeah. presenting that position that why it is considered as anti women in today's context down to the original point we were talking about how secularization of the society has changed the whole society so much so yes, yes there, there are deep underlying fissures and changes that have happened in society uh, social norms have changed drastically um, but nevertheless you know killing is killing yes that we have to be clear about i think there is no can't be a compromise on that one issue but then yes it's a separate topic it's uh, very involved and uh, maybe some other time yes we can discuss that yes ma'am so uh, now coming back to second i think abortion is a particularly volatile topic but uh, apart from that other issues like i said animal animal testing uh, you said you mentioned that we could present more of humanitarian or ethical or compassionate arguments of compassion and yes th- that could create the space yes so now when i have talked with devotees about this i would like to get your feedback like there are there are whole areas of research coming up wherein people can test medicines on not on animals but on substitutes various kinds of uh, artificially created substitutes so that is that kind of research is also advancing but it's not that pioneer it's not that widespread right now so now if a devotee is in a particular field where you know just to get their degree they have to do that animal testing but then after doing that they might be able to advance and maybe pioneer research without doing animal testing uh, in future or pioneer a whole branch where non animal testing research can be done so to what extent see there is black and there is white but then there are shades of gray in between so best would be that a devotee avoids all animal testing but if if that is what is required essentially for one to get one's degree then is it uh, that do it once but then do not choose a career where one has to keep doing it regularly uh, so are there degrees within that also say so some degrees are acceptable and some degrees are preferable to avoid well it's really something that the individual devotees must uh, d- determine for themselves hmm you know that's a choice of career and so on and so forth they they take up careers that involve these things knowing fully well that they will be required to do all of this so they must choose wisely so that is an important element choose a choose a source of livelihood or a career that will not involve any of these problematic areas and activities and even in some way if something like that comes up then try to evade it in some way either by requesting the authorities in an informal unofficial kind of way or it depends yeah so but i it, i don't think it is up to us to say that it's all right to go ahead and do the abortion or it's all right to go ahead and kill those animals just because you can i don't think we can give that kind of a sanction it's really the call that that devote that person has to take hmm because that person is not being compelled to take up this particular career yeah of course there are nuances what if somebody is in that career and then they become a devotee then they start practicing bhakti that's also an, i think like you just said yeah yeah so yeah they will have to take so ultimately it's an individual call based on one's conscience one's understanding of shastra one's situation 
they should try to come out of it somehow they should try to evade that particular prohibited activity of killing yeah. that animal or killing that child it's true and uh, now <clears throat> beyond such cases at a say we talk more at an individual level then you talk also about how you know we could do outreach like you are planning to write books so at a more at a institutional level as devotees we as a movement have not yet come to a place where we will be drawn upon as a resource by the media or the government or others you know as if our movement becomes bigger then say for example tomorrow the government passes some law on some issue maybe abortion or this or that and then there are some certain religious groups which are substantially big or they are representative of larger traditions then often the government asks for what are your tax to take on the media asks what is your take on this so then as devotees we may also have to become or at least some of us some of some devotees will have to become well informed to be serve as public intellectuals and then uh, at the, a time might come where how secularism is actually implemented with respect to particular government policies or with respect to particular social initiatives that we might also come to a level where we could influence that i think uh, prabhupad talked about yeah essential essential yeah so prabhupa talked about broadly two ways i heard it somewhere and, it, and i were apparently heard that bhaktivinoda thakur also said this that you know, we could have a dharmic or a krishna conscious government in two ways one is that we at a grassroots level do so much outreach that we have so many devotees that then devotees elect a devotee representative or we have a head of state who uh, who becomes spiritually minded and who becomes a devotee and that head of state make uh, implements more devotional kind of uh, de- creates a more dharmic environment in society <clears throat> and <clears throat> now this is a bigger subject and maybe it's a little volatile that now in today's world democracy is considered to be almost like a universally desirable form of government and often the west america often takes it up as its responsibility to try to establish democratic governments in other parts of the world but often this has backfired say for example in the middle east the certain dictators were removed but then what came up in front of that in spite of that was even worse so now without going into the merits of the democracy or or in a monarchy people like to use the word theocracy or dictatorship but monarch monarchs can be benevolent also so in general if uh, if some amount of dharmic principles or bhakti principles are to be incorporated at a government level it seems to me that it will be much easier in a if there is some kind of monarchy as a government rather than a democracy because democracy means that that many democratic representatives have to be influenced and that means either that many devotees have to be that many devotees have to be there in the broad community and they elect that many devotee representatives so is this a discussion you would like to take forward or no need to go in this direction too much well i think it it's not so much connected to the idea of secularism i mean but in general the point is valid that yeah my connection uh, was that you know where secularism starts infringing on dharmic values so yes. where secularism prevents us from practicing dharma or what you said that yes. secularism from from impartiality towards religions to almost hostility towards religions so if that trend is to be reversed yeah then, the problem with a monarchy in the modern context is if you have the wrong kind of monarch you end yes. up getting the opposite of what you desired yes yeah. another problem is yeah sorry monarchy. in yeah. the modern day age although in the vedic times in ancient times all over the world monarchy was the system and prabhupada also speaks about it as a preferred system but he also did mention that 
in the modern day and age where to find that ideal person who will be that monarch, that Raja Rishi, and who is so strong and so competent, so intelligent and so dharmic that he can mm. actually take on this responsibility and execute it effectively. So that is a real practical limitation or a problem. That's serious. If such, a, if such people would have come about, then yes, certainly. Yeah. But in the absence of that, what we are left with is, you know, we have to make the, uh, the secular democracies and we have to make the best use of a bad bargain. Yes. They're not ideal by any means. Yeah. You know, another but problem with monarchy is degree of, of, of uh, protection. There's some say you have in the matter. You know, you can create public opinion and influence the way the, the laws are made or whatever. But if there is a monarchy, if there is a despot who is the king and he somehow doesn't like your beliefs or something like that, then that will create havoc. Yes. Yes. And even if one monarch is good, what will be the nature of the successor, we cannot at all predict. Yes, and in that yeah. sense, monarchy can be quite, uh, even if it is favorable now, it can turn out to become quite unfavorable, just maybe a generation later, or a couple yes. of generations yes. later. Yes. And uh, I've talked with some devotees in Africa, and they say that there often, the regimes keep changing. There are, in some countries, not everywhere, but yes. the, the political one group overthrows another group. And then you know, if as devotees, we go close to in one group, then the other yes. group comes up, it becomes a huge problem. Correct. So, and it's happened in Africa and some places like that. Yeah. <coughs> so in so a therefore, sense, at the institution, <coughs> we maintain ourselves uh, politically neutral. Uh, in terms of political parties and so on, officially the institution cannot get involved. Uh, that has to be one of the practical principles. Yes. So often, you know, while we talk about how within a secular government, uh, we do talk about there are some difficulties and there is a certain amount of irreligiosity being spread maybe we need to also see it in context like i think it is it was winston churchill who said or i think abraham lincoln he said that democracy is a terrible form of government but as compared to all other forms of government it is the it is the least terrible or it is the best among all terrible forms of government so that may not apply in the anything vedic context anything else is more terrible yeah, that's true. So just a couple of small points. I think we come to a, we covered most of the major territories. So I was saying that often the, sometimes the condemnation of democracy that some sometimes is done, that it is a terrible or secularism is terrible. We may have to see it in context. So we can't, we can't really compare today's context too much with the traditional context. We have to, compare today's context with other other contexts and it is like the best like Prabhupada would say best of a bad bargain yes, and yes. Uh, so <clears throat> just going on to the other point of you what you said as devotees if we are to become public intellectuals that is essential you said so yeah. this could be a whole big subject in itself but uh, just uh, some points about this that for this to happen, you know, as devotees, there is a, it requires a lot of thoughtfulness, study of scripture, study of contemporary situation, and then finding the appropriate forums to present ourselves. So, <clears throat> so do we as a movement need to also create, uh, create some resources or create some forums for devotees to be able to do these things? Because I have encountered that many devotees, in, many young intelligent devotees, they start practicing bhakti, and they do want to do something like this, but it's uh, it's often quite vague at that stage, and there's not much facility. So, any thoughts on how, if within a secular world, 
devotees are to become public intellectuals one point you made is that we need to we need not quote scripture directly but we can present values which are in the intersection between say scriptural values and contemporary values and so present in that way any other thoughts in that direction i think it is important for whoever is out there in the public domain trying to engage with issues of this sort must be well versed and convinced of our scriptural conclusions and arguments and must have deliberated upon this at length uh because there is a possibility that uh, one may present our case wrongly you know due to not being thoroughly conversant with uh, our philosophy or certain subtler or finer aspects of the philosophy so that's one thing that one has to keep in mind and the other thing is also that one has to be sufficiently um aware of what is happening outside and how things need to be presented according to time place and circumstance what would work what would not work for example uh, just to continue the abortion example you you seen how those who have been on the forefront of the anti abortion campaign in the west have largely been religious groups yes so religion has become the villain uh, so to speak in the eyes of uh, many people who advocate women's rights or uh, human rights and so on and so forth so right now our interest is to establish certain principles that are there that we hold dear so if we can try to present them in a way that will uh, not ring alarm bells for them because the moment you start speaking religious things immediately the whole hostility and that antagonism and the confrontational mode clicks in and then the whole discussion is diverted and there is more heat than light in the discussion you can't really take forward the discussion in a cool headed intelligent way you know and then it, it just deeply polarizes the society even more so we may cherish our religious beliefs and we may even say that yes uh, admittedly my religious beliefs and my religious persuasion have been instrumental in me coming to this conclusion that will be obvious from the fact uh, that we appear we look like the bodhis mm. okay so we don't have to hide that but at the same time we can also point out that the arguments we're going to present are totally secular yes whether it is abortion whether it is meat eating whether it is whatever you know there are many areas in which we can successfully do this it may not be possible in all areas but in many areas it may be possible yeah and in certain other areas we can try to create uh, a sufficient shall we say um a support for our beliefs say the existence of the soul you know you use certain methodologies and use things that are acceptable for them they want evidence based things nowadays okay so follow their methodology and give them compelling evidence circumstantial evidence that points very heavily in that direction mm. so even though you don't have what you call smoking gun evidence but you at least have some compelling circumstantial evidence in that way you mold public opinion you know gradually over a period of time by speaking in a kind of language that they can relate to Yes. and there will also be occasions obviously where you can just directly speak about krishna and there will be not only an audience for that but there will be other occasions when it is desirable to do that mm -hmm. it's just a question of how we present 
Yes, I think before we have any discussion, it's important to like, understand what is the ground on which the other person is situated, what authority yes. they accept. If we if we don't understand that, yes, then say for example, some people might just accept more of a business based argument, finance based argument. So if yes. an argument for cow protection can be made using how cow products are useful in so many other ways. And so sometimes a, simply a finance based argument can also be made. And what you said about uh, <clears throat> you know, presenting things from non religious sources, I think there was in the West, there was a creationism, which was explicitly Bible driven. And now there is the intelligent design movement. Now, of course, the intelligent design movement is also portrayed by the mainstream uh, academia as as basically like Christian creationism only rebranded. But the intelligent design movement tries to consciously say that we do not draw from any religious sources. And in fact, we are a diverse group of people. Some are Christians, some are Jews, some are non-believers. So there are some intelligent. Uh, uh, so they say that we are simply drawing from the evidence that science has given. And based on that, we say that the, the kind of structure that we see in nature, they require the most reasonable explanation for them is some higher intelligence having intervened to make them. So that's, that's I think that's the kind of modus operandi you are referring to. Yes, yes. You know, Desha Kala Patra, that we should speak according to Desh means the place, Kala means the time, and Patra means the person. So speaking according to uh, time and place is clear enough. But according to person, what does it really mean? It means to understand where the person is at. Hmm. What is that person's frame of mind? What kind of consciousness? What are his or her beliefs? You know, what are things that will put this person off? What are things that this person can relate to? What is our goal? Our goal is ultimately to present uh, things in such a way that they will appreciate our conclusions. Yes. So if you want to establish, for example, that you should not eat meat, rather than saying that, you know, for people who don't have faith, to say that, you know, Krishna says this or the Shastra says that, you know, quoting from here and then, then you, you talk about other things. For some people, economics will matter a lot. For some people, environment will matter a lot. For some people, uh, these other uh, moral values or ethical values rather, like cruelty and so on and so forth, that will appeal. And we agree with all of these things. It's just a question of us presenting a certain thing that appeals to certain people. That means, just to phrase this another way, see, there is the <clears throat> there is a source of our message. There is the content of there is the source of our message. There is the content of our message, and then there is the audience for our message. So now, if we consider the source of our message, the scripture themselves are very vast. There's a lot within it, and then we have to consider that. What is it that the audience needs? What is the social, individual or social uh, context will benefit from? And then the content, we, we may draw it from the source, but we may also draw it from other source. Uh, we may, the core content might come from our, um, from our traditional sources, but it might be present, we might also draw from other sources and then present it in such a way that it is, it is that the scriptural source needn't be mentioned because scripture also gives wisdom that can be correlated or that can that also agrees with wisdom that comes from other sources. Then that's how we need to present it. Yes, and the fourth point is a conclusion. You said source, content, person, and conclusion. So the idea is that we bring them to the right conclusion. Okay. Which is 
that meat eating is bad. It should be not done. Abortion is bad. You should not do it. Yes. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. So that was about public intellectuals. Now, now for now, as of now, from what I see, so if devotees want to do this, you mentioned that more of a cautionary note that they should study both the script. They should be grounded in scripture, convinced about scripture. And they should also be well aware of what works. So as of now, within our movement also, this will be something which each individual may have to do individually. We don't, when Prabhupada started the Bhaktivedanta Institute, I was told that it was not just for scientific outreach, but it was just for scholarly outreach. So I think that was maybe that kind of initiative might come up in future, where devotees might be able to come together and do something. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> and uh, so are there any other concluding points you would like to say, or maybe I'll try to summarize, Maharaj? I think we can summarize. Okay. <laughs> so we covered a lot of territory. So we discussed primarily about secularism and bhakti. So I talk, we talked about the history of secularism. I mentioned the European context where it started, that when people, when the Christianity itself split into two, and then Christianity encountered other, other religions and also um, atheism arose because of the scientific revolution and basically people felt that they needed to have freedom for religion and that's why the state and religion were separated and then you mentioned that even in the uh, traditional Indian context if we consider dharma to be multi-strand then there were the kings would ensure that dharma was practiced but different people could practice their particular understanding of dharma their particular uh, particular faith or particular object of worship or particular path so we could say that the broad in the indian tradition was secular but secularism itself has various grades so there is from freedom for religion it has degenerated to freedom from religion so rather than that from say you could say the government is neutral to religion, to government could have, you said, have passive encouragement, it can neutrality, or there can be hostility. So now it is going more towards from, say, in the past, secularism meant passive encouragement, or sometimes like even active encouragement for all religions or whatever, but then it became neutrality, and now it has become to some extent toward hostility. And hostility often means that there is more of a hostility towards the majority religion. Because that's the fear is that's what will pressurize the government to shift in a particular direction. And then we discussed about, say, for example, that one extreme would be that as parents, uh, we leave it only to the government, to, uh, to the society or the culture or the mainstream culture of the government to teach. So you mentioned that when there is there is no emphasis what the, you made a particular statement that when a particular thing is not encouraged then its opposite gets encouraged so, so if we don't teach any religious or cultural or spiritual values then the mainstream secular materialistic values are what children get taught so we need to take the responsibility to teach from our side then the other extreme we talk about how there are some some religions or some strands within some religions which might preach extremist values say those which harm others create hatred toward others or even harm oneself medically or otherwise then the government needs to regulate that and that would come in the broad mandate of the government so but to use that as a bludgeon to demonize all religion is 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 a is fallacious it's like even technology can be misused children can use technology and harm themselves or others so we don't stop teaching technology and science. And then um, we discussed about the current setting in the world where during Prabhupada's times and even now, it's generally where the secular governments are there. That's where we have the facility to practice um, the most easily, although there are different degrees of ease or difficulty. And then we discussed about when devotees are trying to practice in such a situation, uh, 
at the first level our at a private level we should always do our practices uh, and we can't let the government interfere with that and then at a public level we need to follow the uh, laws of the government and certain practices are restricted like say rathyatra can't be done on particular days and we need to follow those laws and if some laws become too intrusive then we can seek help by certain litigations or whatever i think like when the bhaktivedant manor there were there were there were some somewhat restrictions came on them then there was large scale uh, activist activism and that helped them get the space then you talk about the venn diagram where there are certain things which are so one circle of things that are allowed by the state other things is what are what are taught by our tradition so we situate ourselves as much as possible in uh, in the intersection of the two and if some things are not allowed by the state then either we don't do them publicly or we try to influence so that we get the space to do them and certain things might be allowed by the state or even insisted by the state then but they may not be they may be opposed to scripture and then there was a elaborate discussion on that we took abortion primarily as a case study and also animal testing and some other things so there for us to create the space for ourselves in a few some context saying that this is from my tradition i can't allow i'm not allowed to do it that might be allowed that might give the space but more often we may have to present secular arguments like for abortion you mentioned um, ethical ethical legal uh, then scientific scientific and humanitarian no first was no, logic logical and logic reasoning. reasoning logic and reasoning so we could use those kinds of arguments to uh, to persuade others and to create space for ourselves and then of course we went a little bit in detail about abortion or how it has become complicated in today's world so if devotees are to go in this role of apart from ourselves practicing and if we are to influence the larger society as an institution we need to maintain political neutrality but at the same time devotees can become public intellectuals and when they become intellectuals that way we need to consider desha kala patra time place circumstance so considering our audience patra means the recipient and considering the audience means understanding what authority they will accept only then we can present so then we talk about four things we mean saying that we look at this we are we draw from the source of scripture but the content of the arguments all of the source of scripture we may draw from other sources which are appropriate for the particular audience which will be persuasive like the creation of the we present that part of the content which is relatable and identifiable for the people yes relatable identifiable acceptable and <clears throat> then like at maybe the how creationism rebranded itself as in are evolved as intelligent design and then the conclusion should be that we try to elevate people's consciousness so that uh, society at a certain level starts decreasing or avoiding activities like animal slaughter or or especially cow killing and also abortion and in that way as our movement also spreads and we also become as devotees become as devotees become public intellectuals then we may be able to shape the uh, broader governmental macro macro policies also so do i leave out any points maharaj i think you more or less covered yes. the points yes thank you very much for your time and your thoughtful uh, broad perspective analysis of the subject it's always illuminating to have discussions with you maharaj thank you Hare Krishna Hare thank Krishna. you Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna